You're listening to sermon audio from Ankeny Free Church in Ankeny, Iowa, a community in Christ on a mission to reach our community for Christ. To learn more, head over to ankenyfree.church. Well, welcome to the fourth and last week of our series called Why I Believe. Uh, in this series, we've been, you know, we've been talking apologetics. Um, if, if you haven't enjoyed it, uh, we'll come back next week and it's, it's over. Uh, and uh, Curtis is going to pick up our, our prayer series. And uh, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking forward for that, Curtis. It should be a good time. Uh, I'm looking forward to, 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 the, to, that, to finishing that series and then our series in Acts starting in two weeks. But we've been talking about things like the resurrection, you know, why we believe that the resurrection actually happened, why it's in a, in a, a historical event. We, we've been talking about things like the Bible, why we can believe that this book is the perfect, holy, inerrant word of God, and why it's, why it's truth, right? why it's applicable for every day, and why we need it in our lives. And then last week we talked about uh, the afterlife, you know, how we know that there's something after this, that there's more to come. This is not all that there is. Um, how, how we know that there is a reality of heaven and hell and people die and go to one of, one of those two places every single day and the difference that Jesus can make in your life. We've been talking about these issues. We've, we've been talking about giving and being able to give sound and practical reasons in defense of the Christian faith. And why do we need to defend the faith? Why do we need to be able to give answers for the questions that the world asks us? Why can't we just you know, mosey around in the Christian life and just say, I'm just going to kind of focus on me and not really worry about anybody else. I don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable. You know, I don't need to study God's word uh, in, in an intense and applicable way for my life. I'm good with just cotton candy fluff devotions and how I can just live my best life now, uh, all for the glory of God. Well, 1 Peter 3, verse 15, um, it, it, it says, and I, we've, we've referenced it so much, I, I hope we have it memorized, at least to some extent. But it says this, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. And I think we have that on the screen, 1 Peter three fifteen. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is within you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And, and so much of this series, we've just kind of glazed over that first part. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. It doesn't start with other people, friends. It starts with us. Are you living in such a way where you have a conviction that Jesus is holy and we should live holy? Before you're worried about other people, before you're ready to share the gospel, it starts with you. And then are you ready, are you prepared, Peter says, to make a defense, sound arguments, sound reasons to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. We need to know what we believe, why we believe it, and to be prepared to explain our faith and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. What is this hope? Well, Peter says our faith is not just based on philosophical ideas. It's about hope. What's this hope? It's about how people, you and I, your annoying neighbor, that coworker that drives you up the wall, that crazy aunt you have, your kids, whoever it is, anyone can come into and discover a life and an eternity altering relationship with the God of the cosmos who made everything. That's the hope we have. That's the hope we want to tell people about. That's the hope that's called the gospel, and it's good news to sinners on their way to hell. And this morning, talking about that 
life and eternity altering relationship with the loving God of the cosmos who made everything that exists. This morning, we're closing out these four weeks, this series, um, talking about just that and its creation. Why I believe in creation. Well, I believe in science, not faith. You know, I live by facts, not fairy tales. You know, science will take you to places like the moon, but religion, it might fly you into buildings. Maybe you've heard phrases like that before. You know, skeptics frequently paint Christians as uneducated, ignorant, and even dangerous because we supposedly reject the tenets of modern science. And according to many skeptics, science has undermined the need for God. And many in our society today would say that you can't have both. You can't be educated, smart, scientific, and learned, and also be religious, and also be godly, and also have faith. You have to have one or the other. You can't have both. But, this, but I don't think this could be uh, any farther from the truth. Science gives great reasons to believe that there is a God who created the entire universe, including each one of us. In fact, the more we study our earth, our world, the more we realize that Psalm 19, 1 through 2 is correct. It says this, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night, reveals knowledge. Friends, all of creation is shouting the glory of God. And there is no place in the world where God's glory is not being displayed in creation to everyone in the world. His invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, his, his, his eternal attributes, they're clearly seen in creation. And friends, I hope we'll see this morning that there is evidence for a designer. From the smallest of DNA strands to the vast universe filled with the countless galaxies. And before we go any further, I think it's wise that we need to ask the Lord to bless our time together and to help us. I hope you agree. Let's let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we're thankful to be together this morning. May we never stop being in awe of your magnificent creation. Lord, the beauty of your earth, the vastness of your heavens, and the intricacies of of life, Lord, all reflect your power, your wisdom, and your love. And and Lord, as we dive into the wonders of your creation this morning, we ask for your presence to fill this place. Lord, open our hearts and minds to your perfect word and help us to see the world around us, your creation, with fresh eyes appreciating the marvels of your handiwork. And Lord, it's in the precious and holy name of Jesus, our creator and sustainer, we pray. All God's people said, amen. Amen. This morning, friends, I want us to consider three scientific findings that confirm the existence of a creator. Number one is cosmology. Cosmology, not cosmetology, that's something else. Cosmology, uh, it's, it's talking about big things, the study of big things like the cosmos, the universe. And before we see how the cosmos points to the existence of God, let's talk about something called a logical syllogism. Uh, here's an example. I think we have this on the screen. Men are mortal. George Washington is a man. Therefore, George Washington is Mortal. It's pretty simple. Um, Men are mortal. George Washington's a man. Therefore, George Washington is mortal, must be mortal. The same kind of syllogism is used in an argument for the existence of God, and it's called the cosmological argument. And it goes like this. Number one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Number two, the universe began to exist. Number three, therefore, the universe has a cause. I think it's pretty simple, but it's, I think it's also very powerful. Let's look at both premises of the argument and see if the conclusion logically follows. So number one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. This, the statement should be obvious. You know, things don't 
just randomly come into existence uncaused for no reason. If, that, if they did, you know, why don't we just observe this happening all the time? Why doesn't a brand new car just magically show up in my drive, a driveway uh, one morning? Why doesn't money just randomly appear in my wallet for no reason at all? That friend of yours, maybe they're sitting next to you right now, who has horrible breath, their breath wasn't always like that. It was caused by something, most likely too much Taco Bell. But listen... Effects always have causes. That's how the universe works. Number two, the universe began to exist. You know, according to modern cosmology, the, 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 the universe has not been here forever. But it came into, an exi- into existence at, at some point in the past. Now, we're not going to argue how old the universe is this morning. We're just going to argue that it's not eternal. And there are good reasons to think this, that, that, that it's true, from science and philosophy. You know, a piece of evidence proving that the universe began to exist is the the second law of thermodynamics, which says that the universe is running out of usable energy. Now, to understand this, think of your car sitting in the driveway with gas in the tank. Maybe the tank is all the way full, maybe it's half full, whatever amount of gas, there's gas in the car. You turn on the engine and you let your car sit in the driveway. Um, It will run idle for a long time, depending on how much gas you have in the car. But eventually, the car will run out of gas. It'll run out of fuel. It will run out out of usable energy. Now, if the universe did not have a beginning, meaning that it's just always been here forever, then it should have ran out of energy by now. If the universe has been around forever, it literally would have ran out of energy forever ago. I hope that makes sense. But since the universe still has usable energy in it, like a car with gas still in the tank, it had to have a beginning at some point. And as a child, did you ever try to count to infinity? You know, maybe those long car trips on the way to grandma's house. Maybe your family drove to the Grand Canyon. Maybe you're going to Disney World. Maybe you're going wherever it is. I don't know. You know, either you uh, just gave up when you tried to count to infinity or you cheated. Uh, I was the kind of kid who cheated. Maybe that surprises you. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, But I was the type of one who'd be sitting in the back seat just, you know, blessing my parents with my presence on the car ride. 998, 999, infinity, I did it. Yes. That's because you can't count to infinity. Infinity actually isn't a number you can count to. It just means that there is no last number. And for any number you can possibly think of, no matter how big, there will always be at least one more after that. Now, the same way you cannot count forward to positive infinity, neither can you count backwards to negative infinity. This is what is known as infinite regress. This next part's a little heady, so really stick with me here, okay? You, you can keep going backwards forever and ever and never reach a you know, first number, since no such number could exist. But what does this, all this you know, infinity talk have to do with, with creation and the beginning of the universe? Well, well, imagine a lot of dominoes. Now listen, I'm not talking about Domino's pizza lined up. Some of you are way too hungry this morning already. Uh, imagine a line of dominoes. I don't know, anybody like playing dominoes as a game? Anybody like lining up dominoes? I watched uh, the movie Robots the other day with my kids, and Mr. Big Weld in Robots had all those dominoes in his house, and he was riding a wave of dominoes. If you push the first domino over, if I had a line of dominoes up here on, on the table, um, if you push the first one over, it would knock down the second one, it, it, which would knock down the third one, and this would continue until you've knocked over the last domino. Now imagine you were at the end of an infinitely long line of dominoes. Now let's work backwards. Before you could knock down the last one, You'd have to knock down the one before that. And before you could topple the second to last domino, you'd have to knock down the one before that. And you could keep going back forever, but never reach the first domino in line since the line is infinitely long. And if you can't get to a first domino, you obviously can't knock it down to begin the chain reaction to eventually knock down and topple the last one in the line. Now let each of these dominoes represent a period of time, let's just say a day. 
before today, the last domino in the line, before today could have arrived, yesterday had to have occurred. And before yesterday could pass, the, the day before that had to have happened. In the same way you could never topple the final domino in an infinitely long line, if there were an infinite number of days behind us, today would have actually never arrived, yet here we all are sitting in this room. Therefore, there must have been a first moment in time, an original domino to be knocked over to set the chain reaction in motion. Thus, the problem of infinite regress shows that the universe cannot be past infinite. The universe must have had a beginning, a start point. Okay, look to your neighbor and say, take a breather. That was really heady. We're done with the domino talk for this morning. This leads us to our uh, conclusion. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Therefore, the universe has a cause. You know, this logically follows from the first two premises. Now, let's see what the cause of the universe could be. Well, I, I think the the cause of the universe must have been pretty powerful to bring an entire universe into existence. It had to have been pretty smart too. It, it couldn't have been made up of the same stuff of the universe. So it had to be non-physical. Time began the first moment of creation. So, so this cause had to have been timeless or, or outside of time. Also, this cause, I think, must have been personal. You know, to, to choose, to, to bring the universe into existence. And here's the remarkable conclusion, friends. This cause is extremely powerful, super smart, immaterial, timeless, and personal. And to me, that sounds an awful lot like God. Everything that begins to exist needs a cause for its existence. And the best explanation for the beginning of the universe is God. Now, of course, that doesn't take us all the way to the God of the Bible, but it does rule out atheism as a plausible explanation since atheism has no sufficient cause for the origin of the universe. And this, you know, surprisingly, remarkably, matches up quite well with Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created. And after all, if there is a beginning to the universe, there has to be a beginner. Now let's look at the second scientific argument for the existence of a creator. It's the fine-tuning argument, number two. You know, imagine you were hiking through the mountains and you discovered an abandoned cabin. Now, instantly, if you watch any horror movie, you know red flags. You do not enter the abandoned cabin. That is how every horror film begins. Some happy-go-lucky group of hikers are strolling through, and hey, this looks fun, and then they eventually all get, you know, hacked to pieces by the end of the movie, right? But let's just say you still go into the log cabin. Uh, you know, as you enter the, this abandoned cabin, you notice a few things that are, that are strange to you. Maybe you walk in and, and you notice the refrigerator, the, the, the cupboards, the countertops. They're, they're filled with all your favorite foods, uh, how about some of you, let's have a little bit of crowd participation this morning. Uh, say some of your favorite foods. Go ahead. Favorite foods. Cheese? Okay, Jade, I'll play along. Let's say the cabin is filled with every single type of cheese you, should, you could possibly love. There's a fondue uh, fountain that you could just roll around in. Like, uh, like, like the, uh, I think it's Donald Duck when he dives into the vat of gold coins, right? Uh, just all these uh, cheese whizzes there, all these amazing cheeses. You go to the Osceola cheese, cheese shop, all these cheeses are there. Okay, Jade, thanks for that uh, suggestion this morning. If it wasn't Sunday, to me it would be Chick-fil-A, amen? They'd have Chick-fil-A there, every type of Chick-fil-A thing you could possibly have. All right, let's, uh, what about the, the cabin's temperature is set to your liking? Uh, to me, it would be 68 degrees. I like it a little cooler. What about you? Shout out your favorite temperature. 76. 76. What's going on? You guys, like, 
73, okay, very good. Um, let's say your favorite song is, is playing uh, on, on the radio, and I'm just going to say it's whatever the worship team played this morning, amen, that's our favorite song. Uh, and then some of your favorite books are sitting on the table, uh, maybe you're like, I listen to audio, okay, so all of your favorite audio books are there for you, to, for you to put your headphones on and listen to, but the cabin is just stock full of your favorite movies, food, the temperature is just right, everything is to your just liking to the nth degree, it is awesome. What conclusion would you draw? <laughs> Jade, quiet. Since random chance could not bring so many factors together, you would rightly conclude that the cabin was prepared in advance with you in mind. Similarly, the laws of nature appeared to be prepared with humans in mind. You know, in the 20th century, scientists discovered the existence of multiple physical laws that must each be just right for life to exist in the universe. And these laws can be written as mathematical equations, and there are certain values in these equations that are fixed, and they're known as constants. The values of these constants are so delicate that if they were just off by the tiniest amount, life would not be possible in the universe. And so let's just look at one example, gravity. I'm sure you're familiar with gravity. What goes up must come down. If the gravitational constant had just been a little weaker, stars and, and planets would have never formed, and so life would be impossible. But if uh, the gravitational constant was slightly stronger, the entire universe would collapse in on itself at the beginning of time. The gravitational constant is just one of many constants that must be perfectly aligned to allow life in the universe. But why is the universe so finely tuned for life? Well, here are three possible explanations for fine-tuning. Number one, necessity. You know, the, the, the constants of nature absolutely have to be the values they are. There's no reason to think so. The constants could have been different. And if so, the laws of nature would be different as well, making complex life impossible here on earth. Second is chance. You know, maybe we just all won the, the universe lottery. Maybe we're just all incredibly lucky, and the constants just happen to be life-permitting by complete random chance. You know, the odds of this happening would be like having a sea of trillion and trillion of trillions and trillions of blue marbles and one of us reaching down and grabbing the one red marble. That's how delicately fine-tuned our universe is for life and how ridiculously improbable, improbable it is for it to occur by chance. So if we've ruled out necessity and chance, the number three, design, is the only option left. The universe is fine-tuned for life because a divine intellect designed it that way. God set the natural constants to permit life in his universe. In other words, the fine-tuning of the universe best points to the existence of a fine-tuner. Let's talk about some objections, and, and by the way, I think it's important to talk about objections because when you're talking with people, this will uh, come up, um, but there's other reason, probably the most important reason to talk about objections, um, and it's so you don't need to fear the objections. You don't need to fear the objections. God isn't afraid of anyone's objections, and you shouldn't be either. You don't need to be able to, to, to quote-unquote, win every argument or conversation you might have. You just need to treat people the way Jesus treated them. Honor and respect and love. Speak the truth with gentleness and respect. So here are two popular objections to the fine-tuning of the argument. Objection number one, it's the anthropic principle. The word anthropic comes from the Greek word anthropos, and it relates to human beings. This states that we shouldn't be surprised that we live in a finely tuned universe because if it weren't finely tuned, we wouldn't be here to observe it, to be surprised. However, this still doesn't explain why the universe is finely tuned for our existence. Imagine a man is set to be executed by a firing squad, and he's standing before his executioners, and he hears the command fire, and he hears the shots of the guns ring out, and then he realizes after a few moments that he's unhurt. Would, would the man go, well, you know, I shouldn't be surprised that all the bullets missed me, because if they didn't, I wouldn't be here to be surprised. No. He would either think the guns were all loaded with blanks, 
or all the marksmen missed on purpose. Either way, he was intentionally kept alive, and there has to be an explanation. The same is true for the fine-tuning of the universe. And the number two, objection number two, is the multiverse theory. You know, far from just being science fiction, you know, some appeal to the multiverse theory to explain away the fine-tuning of our universe. You know, on this theory, the huge number of universes makes the likelihood of just one being so finely tuned for human life expected. We just happen to be living on this one. A multiverse would not rule out design. You know, let's just say that the comic books and the sci-fi movies and Spider-Man, you know, they're all right, and there really is a multiverse, even if there is. This still leaves certain questions unanswered, like, where did the multiverse come from? Why is there a multiverse that generates fine-tuned universes? Essentially, the multiverse theory just pushes design up a level. Think about it this way. If you wanted to know why, why a car was designed, it, would it be sufficient just to, to point to the factory? Well, of course not. A factory helps in the explanation, but we still need an explanation for the design of the factory. The same is true for the multiverse. It doesn't explain away, but it merely pushes it up a level. The best explanation for the fine-tuning of our universe, for life, is that there is a God who designed this universe perfectly with us in mind. Again, the fine-tuning of the universe best points to the existence of a fine-tuner. And the number three this morning, the third area of life that points to a creator is DNA. And if you watch Zootopia, it's Dunna. Every cell of our bodies is like a tiny factory with biological machinery following routines and commands to, to keep us functioning. And much of the DNA, uh, or excuse me, much of the information in DNA for programming the biological machinery comes from our bodies. The, the, the DNA is our genetic code, our biological operating system. And the DNA in a single cell contains enough information to fill 8,000 books. That's a lot of information. And so here's the bottom line. Whenever we see information, we know how that information arose. We can always trace it back to a mind. You know, let's say, for example, you were strolling along the beach and, and you see written in the sand, J.D. loves Kaylee. Well, would you assume that the ocean drew that in the sand on the beach? No, you would think, well, J.D. and Kaylee probably have been here, and J.D., trying to be romantic, wrote that in the sand, and J.D. and Kaylee are having a, a fantastic evening. Social media posts come from social media users. Books come from authors. Texts come from texters. Articles come from journalists. Friends, even the staunchest of atheists has to admit that there is no explanation, no natural explanation for the origin of of information inside of our DNA, and yet we know that information comes from a mind. Here, here's a simple question I'm going to put forward. Isn't the existence of a designer the most reasonable explanation for the exquisite design we see in DNA? Simply put, the information in DNA points to the existence of an author of life. Friends, science is not against faith, but when done properly, I believe it confirms it. And this matters for how we view ourselves as part of God's creation. In Psalm 8, verses 3 through 4, King David reflects on the wonder of God's concern for mankind in light of creation. King David says this, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man? that you are mindful of him and the son of man, that you care for him. Friends, given the vastness and complexity of the universe, King David is in awe that God even cares for us. He continues in Psalm 139, verse 14, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well, friends, you are fearfully and wonderfully made by God himself. I love David Platt's thoughts on this. He says, this means you have a divine dignity. You're made in the image of God. 
God has formed you. He knit you together. You are wonderfully made by God. So you do not need the acceptance, the approval, and the applause of this person or that person or this group to to look a certain way, talk a certain way, act a certain way, be a certain way. No, you are totally free from all of those restraints when you realize that you've been knit together by God. You're fearfully and wonderfully made by God himself. Live in this reality. Rest in this reality. You are not a grand cosmic accident, as our world would tell us. We are not the result of this blind evolutionary process. God designed the universe with us in mind, and he created you with great care. Your life has value. Your life has purpose. The world says that our value and purpose comes from money, fame, influence, and appearance, but God has a different standard, and I'm thankful for that. Human value comes from the fact that we're made in the image of a perfectly good and all-knowing and all-loving creator. If you're here this morning and you feel worthless, you feel no good, you feel like nobody wants you, you feel like maybe things would be better if I wasn't around. When you're not in Iowa, look at the mountains. When you're not in Iowa, look at the ocean. Look at the trees. Look at the stars in the sky. Look at the animals. Look at the snow that's going to be here in a couple months. We took the refinery, our, our young adult ministry, to the Omaha Zoo a couple weekends ago. I love going to the Omaha Zoo, I love going under the dome where they have the the animals of the night exhibit. You ever been there? Oh, man, it's a blast. It kind of really wakes you up because you're walking on this kind of plank in this kind of makeshift dark swamp, and there's alligators on both sides of uh, of the plank, and you're like, man, at any moment I could just be devoured and eaten if I made a wrong step, but no, it's it's very safe, at least they tell me. Um, (laughs) We took our our young adults to the Omaha Zoo, and we're walking through the Omaha, Omaha Zoo. I love taking my kids to the zoo. And I love showing my kids certain things about certain animals and how God made them that way for that purpose that God deems for that animal. And friends, if if God makes the animals in our world with, with such detail and attention and design, think of how much more he loves and cares for you. King David said the God who created all of this cares deeply for you. A.W. Tozer said, famously said that what comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And in my view, if you want to cultivate better thinking about God, there's no better place to start than the creation account in Genesis. One scholar said it this way, if we possessed a Bible without Genesis... We would have a house of cards without foundation or mortar. We cannot ensure the continuing fruit of our spiritual heritage if we do not give place to its roots. And maybe you're sitting here and you're saying, so what? What does creation matter? How does this affect my tomorrow? Why is believing and understanding biblical creation important? Well, I love Daniel Darling's thoughts. He gives these four realities. Number one, these are the the fill-in-the-blanks on your notes. Creation reveals a God who is not like us. Creation reveals a God who is not like us. You know, in the beginning, the Bible reveals a God who is not a created being, a figment of our imagination or, or a durable crutch that we just invent for difficult times. We see an all-powerful God without beginning and end who is different from our from his own creation, who created something out of nothing, and it should give us comfort to know that there is a God that is above our messiness and a God who is driving history toward a conclusion. It's comforting to know someone's in charge besides us because look at the mess we make. 
Sometimes we act like we want a God we can just reduce to our size, a, a God that overlooks our flaws and, and blesses our indiscretions. We want a God that we can just shape and shift and mold to whatever we think we need or want. But is that reality what we really want? A God who's limited by our limitations? A God who is subject to our fears and captive to our whims. Friends, when we whisper desperate prayers in the night, when we plead at the bedside of a loved one with God, when we pray over our children, we are praying to a God we need to be big. A God we can trust is managing the world that we can't control. And deep down in our souls, we don't want that cheap, plastic God of our age, but an all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing God who is bigger than the problems that we face and can defeat the things that haunt us. And to quote Veggie Tales, God is bigger than the boogeyman, and to that I say, amen. Creation reveals, number two, a God of order and beauty. You know, too often we, 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 we read Genesis as just this didactic his, uh, almost history book lesson that just seems so far away. And, and it's, it, maybe it's real, maybe it's not. But really, we need to step back and we need to behold how God has ordered the world. Look at these parallels, just looking at the days of creation. Day and night, day one. God said the sun and the moon to fill and rule them, day four. Waters above and below, day two with birds and fish to fill and rule them, day five. Land and vegetation, day three, with land mammals to fill and rule them, day six. God is not a God of chaos and division, but a God of beauty and unity and order. Third thing, God reveals a God, or creation rather, reveals a God who is personal. Creation reveals a God who is personal. Genesis describes a God who didn't just fashion the world, create the world, and then step back and leave it. Creation reveals a God who is personal. He wants to be known. God is not distant. He speaks. Two weeks ago when we talked about the Bible, we talked about how God's word is active and alive, how it's sharper than any two-edged sword, how it wants to pierce and prick your heart, how it wants to change you. Right now you have your Bible most likely on your lap or somewhere near you. God's Word is active right now as we're reading it. God's Word is active tomorrow as you're reading it in your devotions. It's active in Sunday school with the kids over there. It's active in your community group. God's Word is active and working in your life because it comes from a God that is wanting to know you, to be known by you. There's a God who cries out, those who seek me diligently, find me, Proverbs 8, 17. He is a father who sent his son, Jesus, to be rejected and raised up on a Roman cross so that we could be reconciled to the one who made us. The old hymn says, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. And that's ultimately the aim of studying Genesis and creation, to help you know and to be known by God, to stir your heart's affections for the one who made you. And in a world seemingly gone mad, we can know and see that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And then fourth and last thing, creation reveals a God of the beginning and the end. And this might be the most important part. Creation doesn't just tell us how the world began, but it also points to how the world will end. Understanding creation helps us see that some of the most recognizable features of the Garden of Eden show up throughout the rest of Scripture. The river that runs through the garden shows up in the vision of heaven we find in Psalm 46.4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. And ultimately in Revelation, where John's vision describes the new Jerusalem, that the tree of life from Eden becomes this disfigured, cursed cross, which upon the Son of God offers life to those who believe and then shows up in the new Jerusalem as the source of health and life. Friends, the Garden of Eden was this sort of temple 
where God dwelt in harmony with Adam and Eve, his first creation, walking in the cool of the evening with them. But then sin came, and the relationship between humanity, you, me, was broken between us and God. And there had to have been a a mediation throughout Israel's history, through those tents in the wilderness, through the temple. And then when Jesus offered that once-for-all sacrifice, the indwelling Spirit of God came into God's people as His new temple and one day redeemed sinners will live in perfect fellowship as God will dwell with His people again. One commentator writes this, Everything that lies in between Eden's gate and the new Jerusalem, the, the bulk of our Bibles, is in essence a huge rescue plan. In fact, we could summarize the plot line of the Bible into one cosmic question. How do we get Adam back into the garden? In Genesis 3, humanity was driven out. You and I were driven out out of, out of the garden because of our sin in the first Adam. But in Revelation 21 and 22, we are welcomed home. We're welcomed home. And I love that hymn. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Man, I got something coming for me next because my creator deemed it so. What a wonderful thought. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, just another day closer to heaven. But until we all get eventually back home, let us walk humbly as image bearers of our creator among his creation, wanting to know and be known by him. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Thank you for your purposes that you have for us this morning to dive into the intricacies and marvels and majesties of your created world. And Father, so much of this study is just the tip of the spear, but Father, your knowledge and wealth and wisdom is just so deep. Father, help us to walk in these realities, to know that you are our creator, that you created everything around us, and that there's purpose to this life. How we should not walk aimlessly, but walk in what you have for us. Father, help us every day to want to know you more and be known by you more. And Father, it's in your Son's precious and holy name of Jesus that I pray. All God's people. We pray that you are blessed and encouraged by this week's message, and we invite you to join us every Sunday in person or online. Have questions about what it means to know and follow Jesus? Simply email Todd at AnkeyFree.Church. Thanks for listening.